countries throughout East Asia continue to deal with the slowdown of European economic activity, uh, and in some cases are still uh, managing the after effects of the 2008 financial crisis. We see this particularly strong in China in this coming year. Uh, the Chinese took a very sharp hit from the 2008-2009 crisis. Their uh, policies to counter that anticipated that Europe would resume uh, its consumption rates, that the European economies would recover, and they haven't. And this is bringing uh, forward to the Chinese a need that they've long recognized, and that is the need to break away from the economic pattern that they're currently under. Chinese economic development has largely been based on the Asian model, uh, which is a model of growth. It's a model uh, based on exports. It's a model based on government-driven investment. And in general, it's a great model to grow fast, but it's not a sustainable model. And China appears to be reaching the end of the sustainability of that model, and the government recognizes this this year. This comes uh, at a complicating time for China because 2012 and into 2013 is a major leadership transition. This is really the first leadership transition in uh, 20 years that hasn't been prearranged. And the number one goal of the CPC, of the Chinese leadership throughout this year, is to maintain social stability. Their view is that social stability will uh, protect the legacy of the outgoing leadership. It will lend credibility to the incoming leadership. The problem for the Chinese government this year in managing this economic transition is that no economic transition runs smoothly. The Chinese have long counted on the idea that they could spend years, decades in the transition and sort of not have the significant social impact that we've seen in, say, South Korea or Japan or Indonesia when they've gone through this same type of uh, upheaval, the same type of economic change. Um, but because of the uh, global economic situation, the Chinese don't really have the luxury of time like they've had in the past. Nonetheless, this year, they're going to still focus on the short term, even though that they know that the longer they postpone these changes, the more drastic the implication on Chinese social structures, on the Chinese economy, and perhaps even on the political system, they will be. As the Chinese focus this year primarily inward, they still exist within East Asia. They still exist within a global structure. Uh, regionally, there has been some tensions between the Chinese and some of their neighbors over maritime territory, over economic policy. We see the Chinese this year trying to mitigate that a little bit, uh, be a little bit more cooperative with their neighbors, but not really give up on their claims to greater territorial control uh, because they need those tools domestically to create a, a sense of Chinese national pride to help hold the country together in spite of the economic problems. A wild card we see this year really is North Korea. It seems thus far that the transition between Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un has been relatively smooth. There seems to be an agreement amongst the various elements of the North Korean elite. One of the things in particular we'll be watching this year in North Korea is this rebalancing between the civilian side of the government and the military side of the government. Uh, the element that Kim Jong-il had put in place to give a certain amount of power base to his son Kim Jong-un was to rebuild in some ways the Workers' Party of Korea to try to strengthen that up in some part as a counterbalance to the overwhelming power of the military. Uh, that was not a process that had been completed by the time of Kim Jong-il's death, and that would be a place of tension that we're watching. Uh, in general, we see that the countries around the region are all looking to kind of hold this North Korean regime in place, not push their luck this year, not try to crack it at this moment.